Before we jump into this morning's message, though, I want to share a chapel praise story with you. So in 2023, uh, one of the things we believe God has called us to do as a community is to really reflect on the good things that he has done, to tell the stories of his grace, his mercy, his healing, his provision, and to stop and celebrate those, and then also to ask him to continue to do those things among us. This morning's story comes from Michael and Beth Woods. Beth wrote, a few months before my husband Michael and I were married, I was told that I would struggle to conceive. We were, of course, shocked by this, but trusted God with the outcome. Six months into our marriage, we were joyfully surprised with the news that I was pregnant with our son, Griffin. After Griffin was born, we hoped to have another child and continue to grow our family. We tried for almost six years to welcome another baby into our home. It was a bittersweet time for us. I began to lose hope while watching friends and family members become pregnant with their first child, then their second, and some with their third as the years went by. In October of 2021, my family felt the Lord calling us to move to Oklahoma from Washington State to be near Michael's family and to plant ourselves in a community. As we settled in and connected with others at Christian Chapel, we quickly found ourselves surrounded by a community of believers who meant it when they said that they were praying for you. We found faith-filled friends who believe that God is able and that anything is possible, no matter the circumstance. These experiences and relationships were encouraging to me as we continued to struggle to have another child. In January of 2023, on our way home from church one Sunday, I believed I heard the Lord say, Faithful, that is my message for you this year. Not your faithfulness to me, but my faithfulness to you. A few months later, a friend stopped me and told me, I don't know what this is supposed to mean for you, but every time I see you, the Lord gives me the word faith. Just hang on a little longer, because he will answer his promise. God spoke these words of hope to my soul and confirmed it through my friend. Recently, after six years of longing, hoping, praying, hurting, and waiting, we found out that we're pregnant with our second child and due in November of this year. And Beth finished saying, God heard our prayer, he answered our prayer in his time, and it was a reminder of his faithfulness to us. And so each week we're celebrating those stories. Um, we, we've been getting a lot of those in at, uh, at praise at christianchapel.com. You can send them several along the lines of Beth. We were praying, we were longing, we were dreaming for a family, and the Lord opened the door for that in a variety of different ways. Um, and so we're looking forward to sharing those with you, but today we want to pray. And so if you're in a spot, uh, maybe this morning where you're thinking, Hey, maybe mother's day is hard. Maybe you're just desiring to start your family, to grow your family, uh, whatever it might be. We believe that God is still faithful, that God still hears prayers. God still answers prayers. And he still has a plan to do that in your life. So, uh, will you join me in a prayer of gratitude and also just in a prayer of trusting the Lord to continue to do it again. So Jesus, we come to you today, Lord, and we're thankful for your story of faith, your story of provision for Michael and Beth. Lord, we pray that as we celebrate your faithfulness to them, that you would help us, Lord, to to come to you again with all of our needs. So we come with every physical need, we come with every relational need, we come with every unmet hope, with every, every dream that is yet to be fulfilled. And we ask Jesus in these spaces, will you release your provision? Will you release your healing? Will you release your salvation? Will you accomplish what only you can accomplish? Lord, you see the dreams, the visions you've given us for our lives. We believe they are from you. We're submitting them to you. And we're asking, Lord, will you accomplish your plan in your time for your glory in our lives? We submit to you. We surrender to you. We believe that you work all things for the good of those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. And so, Jesus, today we ask, Lord, in every area where we lack, in every area where we suffer, in every area where we are in need, will you release your spirit? Will you release your gifts, and will you achieve the fulfillment of your kingdom in our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Again, if you have those, send them to us, praise at christianchapel.com. We love celebrating them together. Today, we're continuing our series through the book of Acts. Acts is a story of the early church. It's the story of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the church over and over and over again. We see these three themes playing. Um, and so on Mother's Day, we're continuing to be in Acts chapter 5. This morning, we're going to talk about what it means to be authentic. And so kind of a, a couple caveats before we jump in today. Um, first, the idea of being authentic is never an excuse to be a jerk. Right? I don't know if you have that friend in your life 
who, um, you know, is really offensive, and they just tell you, you know, I just, I just keep it real. And say, yeah, you're a, you're a real jerk. Like, you're really not nice. I really don't enjoy being around you. So when we talk about being authentic, that's not what it means. Um, the second thing you'll see in just a moment, this morning we're in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira, which I have rarely heard preached um, in church really at all, and I have never heard preached on Mother's Day. And so I think it's going to be okay. Um, but if it's not, and if it is offensive, lady, we have some flowers for you as you leave today. And I would like you to receive those as my personal apology to you if we should have pivoted. Uh, so, so I thought about it, prayed about it. But then as I kind of studied through Acts chapter 5, I, I saw some things there that I think are good for all of us to consider that I believe maybe even have some special application for mom on Mother's Day. If you're not familiar with the story of Ananias and Sapphira, let me read it to you and then uh, you can question my judgment along with me. So Acts 5 verse 1, it says, now a man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. And happy Mother's Day. <laughs> I think this is a good idea. I really do. I think there's some really good things here for us to study, for us to understand. Um, and, and so I'm just going to ask you to trust, not me, because I really don't honestly right now either, but we're going to trust God's direction. We're going to trust God's leading. We're going to trust the scriptures that if it's in there, it's in there for a reason, right? And, and so one of the things I enjoy about preaching kind of through books of the Bible is it brings you to passages you would normally avoid. It brings you to topics you would rather not discuss, and it brings you into some conversations that can be uncomfortable but are very necessary. And so this morning, as we talk about what it means to be authentic, what we're hoping to understand is Jesus has called us into an authentic relationship with God and to an authentic community of believers built on truth, honesty, and in integrity. But the enemy comes with the appeal of the inauthentic life to try to undercut that in every way that he can. And so the, the first thing we have to understand about the appeal of the inauthentic life is that no one wakes up one day and decides today is the day that I'm going to be a fake or a fraud. Today is the day that I'm going to begin to build a reputation on lies and deception. Nobody wakes up and thinks today is the day I'm going to ruin my family. Today is the day that I will run my business into the ground. Today is the day that I will stab a friend in the back. Today is the day that I will begin a lifelong series of deceptions that will end in my undoing. No one does that. Ananias and Sapphira did not wake up one morning and think today is a good day to die. They didn't wake up and think today is a good day to lie. They didn't wake up and think today is a good day to say, see if we can deceive Peter. But the appeal of the inauthentic life is always rooted in a particular context. And so for Ananias and Sapphira, the appeal of their lies and deception is rooted actually in a culture of generosity and giving. So as we saw last week, the early church was defined by their generosity towards each other. It said that from time to time, those who own land or homes would sell it, would bring it to the apostles' feet, and it would be distributed to anyone who had need. And the generosity of the church was so overwhelming that it resulted in them being able to say there were no needy persons among them. 
And then if you back up to the end of Acts chapter 4, just before the story of Ananias and Sapphira, we find an example of a man named Joseph. It says in Acts 4.36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And so what we see here then is for Ananias and Sapphira, they are living in a world where generosity is celebrated. They're living in a world where generosity is honored. They're living in a world where generosity is improving the the status of everyone in their community. They're living in a world where generosity is one of the primary witnesses of the effectiveness of the church. And they decide that they want to be a part of that. Now, the decision to be generous would have been a good one. They saw what had happened with Joseph, the Levite from Cyprus. He sells his stuff. He's called Barnabas, the son of encouragement. He's so generous, so kind, so encouraging. The disciples give him a new name. And so they're kind of looking at this and thinking, well, that's what we want. And so what happens for Ananias and Sapphira is they wake up not with a desire to deceive, but they wake up with a desire to be received, to be noticed, to be held in esteem. They want the recognition of radical generosity without actually doing the work of radical generosity. They want what others have without doing what others have done. And so what we see then is the appeal of the inauthentic life is that it's a shortcut. It's a quick fix into the natural results of a life of character, devotion to the Lord, and authentic community with each other. Ananias and Sapphira model for us the idea that imposters want benefit without cost. When you're you're really engaging in these types of behaviors, and it's easy for us to sit here and think, well, I've never done anything like that. And yet I think if we're all honest, we recognize there is something inside each one of us that would like shortcuts to success, that would like the quick fix to recognition that would like to be the one that others look to, that would like, I mean, I would love it if people gave me nicknames that were positive and affirming, right? Like I've had nicknames in my life and they weren't. And they were, you know, I don't know, have you ever been called five head? Like, do you know what that means? It means most of you, you have four fingers and you put them here, but some of us, we have five all through high school. Five head from my friends. At basketball, I got jeered by my own friends at my own basketball games. Like, who does? I want, I want friends who call me the son of encouragement. I want friends who call me radically generous. I've got five head brigade over here yelling at me, right? This is what we want. This is what Ananias and Sapphira want. They want the benefit, which is fine. It is fine that they wanted to be generous people. It is fine that they wanted to be like Joseph. It is fine that they wanted to provide for the needs of others. The problem was... They weren't willing to actually pay the cost. They wanted the open door without doing the work. They wanted the success without the struggle. They wanted the the trophy without the trial. We can say it in all kinds of different ways, but what it really boils down to is imposters are people who want what others have without doing what others have done. We want the instant success. We want the preference. We want the privilege without paying the cost of long nights, of hard work, of deep hours of prayer, of whatever else might be involved. And so for Ananias and Sapphira, it it can seem on kind of your first reading of that passage, like this is an overreaction from the Lord, an overreaction from Peter. And yet what we see here is that, that they're just trying to make sure we understand Imposters are people who want the benefit without the cost. Right? And, and that, that kind of temptation to fake, that temptation to be a fraud, is so prevalent in our culture. In fact, we have entire social media platforms designed to make it easy for us to show people our highlight moments and never let them see all the other stuff that goes into it. And you, you know, I mean, you've read the same studies that I've read of if the more time you spend generally scrolling through social media, the lower your view of yourself tends to be. Right? The, the more time you spend watching others express, here's the trip, here's the success, here's the scholarship, here's the job, the more your depression starts to settle in in your own life. And why is that? It's because we see all of their success. We want it. We don't think we can get there on on our own. And so we either then give in to this low view of ourselves, this depressed life, or we begin to look for shortcuts to do it. I don't know that there is maybe another group of people in the world who face a higher pressure to appear to have it all together than moms, right? And, And moms, God bless you. You put most of that on yourselves, I mean, and I mean that as 
as, with as much kindness and gentleness and love and compassion. But there is, there is nothing like a mom's ability. Like we have, right, we call it mom guilt, right? You ever heard anyone talk about dad guilt? Absolutely not. We don't have it. We're good. I mean, our kids are probably going to be fine. Life's probably going to be okay, right? But mo their mom guilt is just, it's a, it's a real thing. You have this pressure, and, and it's, it's pressure you put on yourselves. It's pressure sometimes that you receive from society. This pressure of like, I've got to wake up an hour early every morning so I can read my Bible and pray and be the spiritual mom that God wants me to be so I can walk in the gifts of the Spirit, so I can display the fruit of the Spirit, so I won't lose my temper. And then I probably need to wake up an hour early so that I can work out and I can be a strong mom and I can be in shape for my kids and I can do these kind of things. And, and I probably need to wake up an hour earlier so I can provide them with good, clean meals from our organic non-GMO garden and so that I can, you know, lean meat focused meals and snacks and, and I can do all these things. And then I've, I've made, so by the time you figure it out, you're just not sleeping anymore because you've got to get up so early so you can do all the things. And, and then there's a pressure of, and I've got to be put together when I drop them off at school. I've got to smile. I've got to be nice. If I'm educating them myself, I've got all that extra pressure as well. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to volunteer, whatever the callings on your life might be. You feel like you have to have it together all the time, every where or the whole world will fall apart. And so what I would want to encourage you with today is uh, in the scriptures, we have an example of people who fake it and they are not role models, right? Ananias and Sapphira are a resounding announcement to God's people and especially to the early church that God is creating an authentic community where we are who we are where we're not pretending to be someone that we're not, where we're not trying to meet some false expectation laid on us by culture, where we're not living for the applause or the affirmation of others, but that when our souls have been made right with the Lord, we've been brought into relationship with each other, then we can be open, we can be honest, we can be authentic in our interactions with each other. And so moms, what, what I would tell you today, if you feel that pressure, is one, pray about it. Two, find a mom who's gotten over that and just let her begin to pour into you, right? Because I, I know for me as a dad, like there are times with Angie where she'll tell me the things she's worried about with our kids or worried about in life. And I, and I just don't understand, you know, and, and, and I'll just honestly tell her like my best advice is don't worry about that, right? And, and I don't know, husbands, if you've given that advice to your wife, it's not well received. <laughs> Uh, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't go well. In fact, she, she told me the other day, you know, hon, you would do better. Her saying to me, you would do better with a little bigger box of care and compassion. Um, cause I tell her all the time, like, just put it in the, I don't care box. She's like, I think that's your only box you have left anymore is an, I don't care box. I'm like, no, I care about you and the kids and Christian chapel. And other than that, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, so, but, but I get it. So moms, here's what I would say. Understand who you are in Jesus, find another mom who loves Jesus, and let her help disciple you and mentor you on that path of just living an authentic life before the Lord. Ananias and Sapphira's story teaches us that we don't want to be imposters. We don't want to chase all of the benefits without any of the cost. And, and the reason is not just because it leads to an inauthentic life, but it kind of puts us on this slippery slope where we are sliding away from God's plan and away from God's intention. And as you kind of work your way through that story, what you begin to see is that the inauthentic life is built on lies. It says in verse 3, Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Now, the, the initial reading, as I said earlier, kind of seems like an overreaction to, to what's happening here. It seems like Peter should have just maybe said, Ananias... We all know this isn't what happened. So just come clean. But, but what you read as you read through there is Peter does give him a chance. He acknowledges what happened. He asks Ananias about it. When Sapphira comes in, he gives her a chance as well. Hey, is this really what happened? She confirms that it is. But, but it, it still, to me, at least seems a, a little bit just kind of extra, a little bit too far, a little bit too heavy handed in a response until you understand what's actually happening. And what's actually happening here is this is in the, the infancy of the church. 
And in the infancy of the church, Ananias and Sapphira seem to have some level of influence where they have interaction with the apostles, where they are interacting with Barnabas, where they are recognizing the good things that the church is doing. So they seem to be believers. They seem to maybe even be some form of influential believers or possibly even leaders in the early church. And yet the enemy attacks them. And what the enemy is trying to do is weave deception, dishonesty, and lies into the fabric of the church from its infancy. And so Peter comes hard against them. The Lord is coming hard against this attack of the enemy because of the danger of a a culture of dishonesty being woven into the church. And so, so again, kind of remember the context. The context is that the church is in its early stages. It's still largely based in Jerusalem. And it's grown, right? We've seen in Acts, it's grown from a couple hundred to 3,000 to 5,000. But even within that, it's still located mostly in Jerusalem, in this small city, where generally people know each other's business. Right? And, and I don't know if, if any of you grew up in small towns or maybe grew up in small churches, but if you did, you can sympathize maybe with what had happened here. If everybody generally knows everybody's business, right? It, it, they didn't even have Zillow, but they had ways to figure out how much you paid for your stuff. So, uh, but, but they had this opportunity. And so if this goes unchecked, if Ananias and Sapphira are allowed by the Lord to walk this deception through, If they're allowed to say, this is what we sold it for, and they keep back part of it for themselves, and then, like Barnabas, they are celebrated as sons and daughters of encouragement. They are celebrated as pillars of generosity. Eventually, the story would get out to others in the church community of, this is what they sold it for, this is what they told Peter they sold it for, and apparently none of the apostles and the Lord doesn't care about this deception or this dishonesty, and it would begin to build in a system of hypocrisy and deceit into the church from its earliest moments that would be like a a poison pill that just continues to bring death in generation after generation after generation. And so Peter's confrontation with Ananias and the Lord's confrontation with Ananias and Sapphira is a confrontation against a direct attack of the enemy to try to cut the legs out from under the church in its infancy. And we begin to understand that it should then help us understand why it's important for us to continue to live lives of integrity and lives of honesty. If God was serious about it, then he's serious about it now. And the reason is because one lie always turns into multiple lies, right? You, you know, this in, in your own life, imposters consistently lie. When I was, uh, when I was in Uh, probably kindergarten. I think it was kindergarten. There are a lot of stories from my childhood where I got spanking. So sometimes they all run together, you know? Uh, I don't know. Some of you might be like that. Some of you not, but I think I was in kindergarten and uh, in kindergarten, I had a profoundly gifted ability to lie. And I, and, and what I learned though early in life was your lies compounded. And if you told one, then you usually had to tell a second one. And if you told a second one, you had to tell a third one. And, and I think in the stretch of one semester, I, I went to a neighbor's house and, and their mom wouldn't let them come play. We lived in a small town in Kansas and, and she wouldn't let them come outside. And I told her, well, that's too bad. My family's moving to California tomorrow. And I really just wanted to play before we moved. So she sent them out and we played and I went home and completely forgot about it. And then I, then I saw her uh, after dinner knocking on our front door and I tried my best to intercept my mom, but I didn't make it. And, and so that ended how you would think. And, and I remember, you know, shortly after I was, I was in kindergarten and I looked at the scissors in my hand and I thought they're the little safety scissors, the plastic ones. I thought, I wonder if those cut hair. And so I pulled it out and I cut it at the scalp and I came home with a square out and my mom asked me what happened. So I told her, Kelly, the girl who sat next to me, cut my hair without my permission. And it really upset me. And, and I had a, a whole story that went along with that. And uh, poor Mrs. Keeker, my kindergarten teacher, shortly after we had show and tell, and I, I brought a little turtle that somebody in our church had brought us back as like a, a souvenir from their Caribbean cruise. And she asked us where we got it. And I told an elaborate story about how my grandparents were missionaries to Africa and had brought it back for me. And, and I hope to go see them one day. And, and I remember at parent teacher conferences, she asked my mom and dad, which one of your parents are missionaries to Africa? And 
I said, neither one, actually. Uh, mine's a farmer, mine lives in Kansas City, and, and I got spanked again. Uh, but what you, what you learn, hopefully, and hopefully like me, you get to learn it early in life, is that your lies always compound. Your lies always spiral. And for Ananias and Sapphira, if they would have succeeded in this deception, it's a lie that just kind of goes on and on and on and on. Every time they would have been celebrated as generous people, they would have had to live the lie again. Every time somebody would have asked them for lessons in stewardship, they would have had to live the lie again. Every time somebody thanked them for being part of God's provision in their life, they would have had to live the lie again. You know this is true in your life. I know it's true in my life. It's one of the reasons God is so serious about just live an authentic life. Be a person of integrity and honesty because one lie never leads to truth. Lies always lead to more lies, to more lies, to more lies. And so if you find yourself even this morning with the tendency to shade the truth, with tendencies to exaggerate, with tendencies to leave out parts of the story, with tendencies to make your lower seem low or your higher seem high, I would warn you this morning, you've got to stop. It will not get better. Imposters consistently lie, and that lying will destroy authentic relationships. As you embrace a culture of lying, a culture of deception, what you find is that you begin to lie so frequently about who you are, about what you've done, about who you know, about where you've been. You begin to lie so elaborately that you will eventually get to the point where you can't really even tell the difference in your own life anymore between what is truth and what is false. And at that point, your character is so thoroughly corrupted that barring the miraculous intervention and deliverance of God, you will begin to destroy every relationship that you have. A lack of honesty will ruin your marriage. A lack of honesty will ruin your relationship with your children. A lack of honesty will ruin your relationships with your parents. A lack of honesty will ruin friendships. A lack of honesty will be a bar that keeps you from entering into authentic Christian community. A lack of honesty will spread like a cancer and destroy a church community. A lack of honesty will poison everything it touches. And yet culturally, for us, there's there's the idea at times of, but everybody does it. Or I'm, I'm lying in ways that don't harm others. This is just about advancing my career. I'm just playing the game that everybody else plays. I'm just doing the things that everybody else does. And yet for us as followers of Christ, what we're being taught in Acts chapter 5 is the Lord is serious about us being men and women of integrity. The Lord is serious about us living in authentic and truth-filled relationships with him and authentic and truth-filled relationships with each other. And so anytime I experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit about areas of deception, areas of falsehood, areas where I'm lying, areas where I'm being tempted in those spaces. I'm going to stop and not dismiss them as just, it's a little thing that God doesn't really care about. Because the overwhelming message of Acts chapter five, at least this portion we're reading this morning, is that dishonesty, a lack of integrity, an inauthentic life is a very big deal to God. And what we have to understand, because even though we understand lying is sin, somehow when it comes to lying in some of these areas, we begin to excuse, we begin to ignore, we begin to to just kind of deflect some of the attention, some of the blame from those areas. But Acts chapter 5 is very clear that the inauthentic life not only leads to a life of lying, but ultimately the inauthentic life leads to sin. It's just, it's the outright embrace of a way of life that's opposed to God. And so the story of Ananias and Sapphira teaches us a couple things. First of all, it teaches us that we should not cheat the system. We shouldn't cut corners. We shouldn't really even spend any of our time or energy trying to be the person that someone else is or trying to achieve the things that someone else has. But our primary concern should be, what is the Lord asking of me? And am I willing to be obedient? Ananias and Sapphira's story also teaches us just be completely honest, right? Peter's pretty clear with them of, You didn't need to do this. When you sold the land, the money was yours. 
You could do with it as you wished. You could have come and said, hey, we sold our land and here's half of it. You could have come and said, we sold our land and here's a gift. You could have sold the land, made a gift and not said anything all, at all about it. But the language of the passage tells us that Ananias and Sapphira set out to intentionally deceive the church, deceive the Lord, and they conspired together to build their reputation at the expense of the truth. And when you begin to understand it that way, you begin to understand maybe why God comes in such a hard and fast judgment in this setting. Acts chapter 5 is trying to give us two things. It's trying to give us a high and holy view of God. And it's making clear that, yes, we are in a new covenant, and yes, we do walk in relationship with Jesus, and yes, he has forgiven you of every sin, and he has welcomed you into his family. And yes, he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and yes, he walks near you, he goes before you, he draws near to you when you're brokenhearted, he provides for your needs, and he forgives your sins. But what we don't want to lose sight of is he is still a holy and righteous God. He is not someone to be messed with. He is not someone to be negotiated with. He is not someone to be manipulated or played with. And so Acts 5 is giving us this high view, just in case there's, there's some parallels that are, are interesting. We don't have time for them between Ananias and Sapphira's sin and Achan's sin when the people are entering into the promised land. And in both cases, what's happening is God is making a resounding statement at the beginning of a community of we will be men and women of integrity. And we will live in a holy and righteous fear of God. We do not live in terror of him, but we live with an appropriate respect, with an awe for who he is and what he's accomplished, with an understanding that his holiness is completely unlike ours. And yes, Jesus has brought us near, but he is still God. And he is still holy and demands our holiness in response that he's made possible for us. So Acts 5 renews and emphasizes that believers are supposed to maintain and live with a high and holy view of God. The second thing is that believers are supposed to live with a high and holy view of the church. Now for us as Protestant, evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic Christians. We uh, love the church, but we don't always necessarily have a high view of the church. And, and what I mean by that is, is that we appreciate, we respect, um, but we, we, for the most part, have kind of gotten away from some of the things that, like the church is this sacred space. And I'm not necessarily wanting to go back to some of those. Like I remember being yelled at as a little kid for wearing a hat in the house of the Lord, uh, for running in the house of the Lord, for yelling in the house of the Lord, for spitting. Probably should have got yelled at for that one. Um, you know, some other things. But, but you just, there were all kinds of things you didn't do in the house of the Lord. And, and as we've moved into a, a more welcoming environment, a more casual environment in many ways, it's, it's helped us, it's opened the doors, it's made people feel more comfortable. And yet, that maybe we've lost just a bit of an understanding, not just of the holiness of God, but of the holiness of the church. But when we talk about the holiness of the church, we're not talking about this building and we're not talking about this land. We're talking about you and me, about our relationships with each other, about your relationships with other believers. And what Peter makes clear to Ananias is you have not lied to me. You've lied to the Lord. And so what Peter is helping us understand is the same principle we see throughout scriptures that every sin at its core is a sin against God. And so your sins might hurt other people. Your sins might harm other people. Ananias and Sapphira woke up thinking they were going to lie to Peter and the apostles. They did not put together that in doing so, they were lying directly to the Lord. And so as Acts 5 kind of lifts up this high and holy view of the church, it should help us have a deeper, holier, more reverent understanding of our relationships with each other. The reasons we can't lie to each other is because this is a holy community built and established by Jesus Christ. The reason that I have to walk in integrity before you and you have to walk in integrity before me is not because of me or not because of you. It's because Jesus is the one who's brought us together and Jesus is the one who holds us together. And when believers begin to understand that when I am dishonest with my brother or sister in Christ, when I lie to my spouse, when I lie to my children, when I lie to my parents, when I lie to my boss, when I do these things, it's as if I'm lying to the Lord himself. Then we begin to understand why honesty and integrity are held in such high value in the early church and continuing for us today. 
And so Ananias and Sapphira, what they teach us then is, is we must live in this way. Now, as you, as you keep reading the story, it just kind of goes from bad to worse. Ananias dies. Somehow his, his wife doesn't find out. They have him buried before his wife even knows what has happened. She shows up at church. Somebody asks the question. She doesn't get the opportunity. She falls dead. They, they bury her. We, we don't know exactly how they died. We don't know exactly what the circumstances were. We don't know any of that. All we know is they conspired to sin against the Lord and against the church. They were given an opportunity to repent. They refused and they died. We're not given any information about their standing with the Lord, of, of what happens with them when they appear before him after death. We don't, we don't know any of that. And to speculate is beyond what the scriptures tell us today. And so all we can really do is stop and say, well, if that story is there, why is it there and what's it mean for me? And it's there to teach us to have a high and holy view of God, to have a high and holy view of the church, and to live in honesty and integrity with each other. And it's also given to teach us just very simply, when we are fake, we lose. When we try to be someone we're not to achieve something we haven't earned, we lose. When you try to pretend that you have successes you haven't earned, you lose. When you try to pretend that your, your pain doesn't bother you, you lose. When you try to pretend that the, the, the events of your past have not shaped you, you lose. When you try to pretend that the sins don't still hold on to you, you lose. When you try to pretend that you somehow don't need the Lord or don't need community, you lose. In every area where you are tempted to be fake, to be dishonest, to be a fraud, you will lose if you give in to that temptation. But the good news of Acts chapter 5 is of all the stories of generosity, this is thankfully the only one where someone dies. This is not a pattern that God continues in the church, which I, I don't know about you, but thank God. Because if every lie you told in church resulted in your death, I wouldn't have made it out of kindergarten. All right, and some of us, like you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have made it into the building this morning. We, we've all have those areas where we're dishonest. We all have areas where we're tempted to shade the truth. We all have areas where we want people to think more highly of us than they should based off of who we are or what we've done. And my encouragement to you this morning is God knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what you're struggling with and he is choosing to welcome you into his family and into his community. And so we can live in authentic relationship with him. We can live in authentic relationships with each other. And so on Mother's Day, we're encouraging moms. God sees you and knows you. He loves you and has a plan for you. He knows the children that he's given you and he knows the challenges that they have brought to you. He knows your shortcomings and weaknesses and he intends to empower you with his Holy Spirit for every task he's laid before you. He knows the areas where you feel successful and he knows the areas where you feel like a failure and he is at work in every single one of them. And to the rest of us, we remember that God knows us, that he cares about us, that he has a plan for us and we can live an authentic relationship with him, authentic relationship with other believers. We can embrace a high and holy view of the Lord, of the church and still draw near to him and to each other. We stand with me, I wanna pray for us. Jesus, we thank you today for your goodness and grace. We thank you, Lord, that even when the scriptures are hard and challenging, that they speak words of life and hope to us. And so, Holy Spirit, we come this morning inviting you to reveal the spaces in our heart where we are tempted to shade the truth. Will you reveal the places where we are looking for shortcuts and quick fixes to lives of honesty and integrity? Will you show us, Lord, the places where we need to repent the places where we need to seek reconciliation, the places where we need to initiate forms of restitution based off of our lies and dishonesty. Jesus, we come today wanting to be men and women of integrity, wanting to be men and women who live with you and for you and who live in open and authentic relationships with each other. So Jesus, we invite you today to release the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our lives, in our relationships. And as your spirit reveals our shortcomings, we want to repent and turn from those things so we can walk in the fullness of life and the healthy relationships that you've created us for. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey, Christian Chapel family, I hope this Acts series is helping you understand the important nature of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the church in your life. If there's any way that we can pray with you, please drop those off for us at christianchapel.com slash prayer. If you'd like to partner with us in taking the good news all over our community and around the world, you can do that at christianchapel.com slash give. We pray you have a great week and you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit.